quick, brief, little background on GraphQL. What is it? It is an open source data query and manipulation language for APIs um, developed internally at Facebook. So essentially it's a mechanism for you to query information, query data in the form of APIs from the back end. That's as simple as you can get it. Then when was it created? It was created back in 2012 and was publicly released in 2015. It was created at Facebook. And by 2018, it was then moved to the GraphQL Foundation, which was hosted by the Linux Foundation. And I think if you go next to how it, how does it work? It essentially allows for clients to define the structure of data required and the same data is then returned from the server. It essentially enables um, users to essentially query specific information that they need um, after that has been defined into the, the schema of, um, of GraphQL. Schema essentially is a blueprint of the data model that uh, pertains to the backend of the solution. So that's sort of how it actually works. And more importantly, I think probably the most important part is why was it actually created? So it was created back in 2012, 2015 because uh, Facebook was moving into the space of multi-platform applications, the omni-channel applications, and they did not want to have, uh, they did not want to create different API endpoints or REST API endpoints for each individual platform that they were gonna be creating because then if they wanted to add something in the future, then it was again gonna be yet another endpoint that needed to be done. Moreover, those endpoints weren't exactly flexible by themselves. Therefore, the same endpoint could not be used across all of these platforms. If you were to look at an example, for instance, if you were to think about a weather application, then the kind of information that you would be looking at, at on your desktop or on your web page is probably gonna be a lot more extensive compared to what you might be actually experiencing or receiving in your mobile application and perhaps even further less if you're going to be using something like a wearable device so for all of these different requirements you might need different kinds of data and using the same endpoint would mean essentially um, using too much information or in some cases too little information which again is not ideal which is why the alternative to that is using specific api endpoints to uh, address the needs of each individual platform but then there can be there might no, not be any end to that because you are then looking at multiple possibilities or multiple platforms coming up in the future. So to enable that flexibility, um, it was create, GraphQL came into existence to create flexible omni-channel applications by enabling fetching of the exact data that was required by each of these platforms without the need to create multiple endpoints. So that was sort of how or why GraphQL sort of came into existence. Then what kind of operations does it actually support? GraphQL supports uh, querying, which is essentially reading or requesting for data. It supports mutations or what's called writing of data. It is, and finally, it is capable of subscribing or subscriptions to changes in data. Now for the first two, if you really look at REST APIs, essentially, if you think about uh, your gets, that's essentially what queries can be. Again, it's not a necessity because you can re request information using post, not best practice, but it can do that. But effectively get maps to query and mutation essentially, which is changing or manipulation of data. That is all to do with something like post or patch or put or delete. Those kind of um, activities essentially can be uh, essentially similar to mutations in GraphQL. So just as a brief rundown today, we are gonna be looking at queries alone. We are not gonna be going into mutations. We are not gonna be going into subscriptions. Uh, if you are interested though, however, do um, leave a comment or send us an email because uh, we'll be happy to do a separate webinar addressing those capabilities uh, in the future. So moving right along, let's talk about a few different challenges um, for enterprises and challenges with adoption of GraphQL as well. So let's start with the very first one, which is essentially uh, cost of migration. Now, most organizations are not starting from scratch. They already have legacy systems. They already have systems that are in place. And when they start considering GraphQL as a technology, a lot of times they have to think about, oh, I need to potentially rip apart my existing system and create something from scratch, which is gonna be resource intensive. It needs to be built as well as maintained over a period of time. And in order to, for me to do all of this, I need uh, a degree of expertise that who understands the nuances around this particular technology. Um, so that obviously translates into uh, resources, both from 
human capital developers as well as overall costs involved in, in development and maintenance. So that is one of the key uh, challenges in organizations who might have a potential use case, but um, are hesitant in adopting GraphQL. One of the other challenges within an organization, a modern organization, is that they're dealing with data from multiple data sources. And this is because organizations today are having to deal with not just internal APIs where, which are coming from different microservices, but they're also having to integrate from with external endpoints because there is just such so many different services systems that an organization needs to work with. Moreover, there might be existing systems that already are doing some of these mappings and those might be much more hard coded or hard earned into, baked into the existing system. So if you're thinking about migrating into a technology like GraphQL, you have to start then the, the fear there is, can I replicate those models in an easy way? How much effort is that gonna take in order for those mappings to essentially be remodeled into a completely different technology and then maintained over a period of time? While all of these integrations are quite important, you need an easy way to actually do, do that and expose that information, and potentially combine data from all of these different sources to prevent data silos still, but to do that in a way that um, does not take up a whole lot of time, a whole lot of cost, and a whole lot of resources, which again can be a hesitation in terms of why GraphQL could be a bit of a challenge within organizations. And then finally, even with all of this in place, the next step is always going to be security. Now, while REST endpoints work primarily at the HTTP layer, um, which is the end, you secured the endpoint with all of your different possible security me mechanisms, authentication, authorization mechanisms, um, that is it. But with GraphQL, you are working on two different levels because you're working on the HTTP layer as well as you're working on a data layer, which is essentially dealing with all of the different queries and data that you are requesting as well as receiving back. So you need a mechanism to make that secure as well. And two instances of that specific nature of security requirement is one is field-based permissions. Now imagine the, the, the one of the key issues around GraphQL is that, of course, it lends you a whole lot of flexibility. So you can essentially create a data graph or a schema, which can have all of these different different fields that can be utilized. You're exposing out that endpoint, exposing out that schema, and then for different users or different use cases, people can request exactly the kind of information that you need. But that also poses a challenge from a security perspective because now you do not have a predictable path anymore. There is no guarantee in terms of exactly what kind of information is gonna get requested at what point of time and to what frequency in that nature. Um, moreover, you can also request for, um, if you're exposing any and all fields in your schema, then that may not be desirable for access to, to all of those all of your use cases. Um, a case in point, for instance, could be that if you have two different use cases for your data graph, where you need, you want to make some information for a user, perhaps. So if a user has information like ID, email, username, address, um, you want to make this information available, but not everyone should have access to the user's email ID or address because that could be that is confidential information. So for maybe hobbyists who are just requiring some bits of information uh, like you'll see in today's example maybe they just need the information about that that user in terms of the username and the user id associated with say their social media posts and that's the extent of it they do not need to know the email id they do not need to know the address then you can um, prevent you can essentially create restrictions on that field from being exposed while at the same time if you wanted to expose that field out for maybe some specific kind of use case where you know you're looking at analytics information that requires that email ID or requires that uh, address because you're look, doing uh, location-based an analysis in, in some form or fashion, and you want to expose that data um, to that specific, specific kind of user, then you can do that. So field-based permission can essentially help you um, sort out those, those different permission requirements, as opposed to you having to create, um, again, specific schemas or specific GraphQL endpoints to meet each of those requirements. Now, third, um, here is, or the second security issue can be query depth limiting. And why is that important? Now, if you think again about the flexibility of a GraphQL schema, there you can essentially nest or request query, request information in a nested format, which means that your query can have pretty much, can go as deep as you want it to be, or as deep as a user 
more importantly, might want it to be. Again, you do not have control in terms of how exactly that's all going to get stacked up. So what could end up happening is you could have someone requesting information that is maybe six or seven levels deep. Now, maybe a specific use case might warrant that, but that is going to be very, very taxing to your servers. So if your servers are not capable of handling that level of load, then that is going to be a challenge overall from your service management and which might lead to a denial of service attack, denial of service because of this issue. Moreover, you could expose yourself to malicious uh, attacks as well, where someone is, is essentially deliberately making these calls to choke up your systems. And that, again, is an undesirable system and a threat to your security. So with all, all that being said, uh, we created a solution that essentially addresses each one of these issues and will show you um, shortly in terms of how you can do that without needing to write a single line of code, which is obviously the most powerful feature here. Not only are you going to be able to transform your um, REST endpoint into GraphQL, not only are you going to be able to um, combine data from multiple data sources, not only are you going to be able to secure your endpoints and expose those endpoints, but you're going to be able to do that without having to uh, write any single line of code, which is again, very, very exciting. So. What is the universal data graph? The universal data graph is a way for you to transform, or it's, it's, a, it's our product, which essentially allows, enables you to transform and combine multiple APIs into a universal interface. It's a central integration point for all your internal as well as external APIs in a no-code uh, manner. You can use REST endpoints, you can use GraphQL endpoints, you can combine both of them together if you want. You can even go to the extent of combining SOAP endpoints, however, for that, uh, you need to convert SOAP into REST, which we do have a plugin ready available. And there is a tutorial that I have created if you are interested in figuring out how you want to go, go about doing that. So with that all being said, let's move on to uh, the exciting part of today's um, presentation, which is going to be the demo. And just to set a little bit of a stage today, we are going to be looking at um, three different REST endpoints. One is going to be about user information. We're going to be transforming that into GraphQL. And then we're going to be mapping uh, information about posts and information about comments. So users are going to have posts. These could be social media posts that they might have posted. And these posts will have comments. And we're going to be seeing how these three completely separate REST endpoints can be brought together in an easy manner using the universal data graph. And we're gonna take it even a step further and make it secure and available for consumption.